Welcome to the Technology Addicts Podcast, powered by Avnet Abacus. Mobility, the way we get around, is at a crossroads. Over the coming years and decades, its transformation will be far more profound than simply replacing fossil fuel-powered vehicles with electric ones. As mechanical vehicles morph into sophisticated computers on wheels, they're calling into question long-standing ownership models, business strategies, and even entire job categories. Successfully managing this transformation will require close collaboration between established car makers, startups, and cities. Digital Hub Mobility, a startup accelerator based in Munich, Germany, offers a platform for these types of conversations to take place. To learn more about the challenges facing mobility and explore where the field is headed, we'll be talking to Kirsten Hegnell, Managing Director at Digital Hub Mobility. Hi, Kirsten, and thanks for joining us today on the Technology Addicts Podcast. Hi, Jan. I'm happy to be here. So, Kirsten, to start off, how did you get to work today? Actually, I rode my bike to work this morning, as I always do. It's the most sustainable way to travel, and for rides that are shorter than five kilometers, it's also the fastest. I don't have to worry about traffic jams, and I don't have to worry about parking, and I've already gotten some exercise in. So, are you satisfied with the current forms of mobility? No, nope, I'm not. I'm not satisfied because the privately owned car still accounts for almost 80% of all passenger transport. And more than 95% of these cars are still powered by fossil fuels. Here we're a very, very long way away from uh, decarbonizing. The other aspect is that all these vehicles are highly underutilized. As you know, they're only used one hour per day, the average car. And the rest of the time, they're sitting around parking, using up very valuable urban space. If you look at the seat capacity, it's even worse. Seat capacity used at any given point in time is less than 2%. So we would never design a system this way, in such an inefficient way, if we were to build it again from scratch. And by the way, it's also very dangerous because it kills around 3,000 people every year in Germany alone. So how would you like to move around 10 or 20 years into the future? Well, I'd like everybody to be able to move around climate neutrally and actively wherever possible. So for the short trips, walk and bike. A lot of people are overweight. Many people don't get enough exercise. Here's an easy way to do it. And for those trips that are longer, where you need to be transported, I would love to have autonomous systems that combine the efficiency of public transport with the privacy of a personal car. The Digital Hub Mobility was established to find innovative mobility solutions. What exactly is its objective? To be very precise, the Digital Hub Mobility was initiated six years ago by the German Ministry of Economics and Climate Protection, and it was initiated to support digitization and innovation in the mobility sector. And the partners have actually created their own vision of driving sustainable mobility. And the mobility sector is very complex. No single player can change things fundamentally alone. And that's why it's so important to have a hub that brings all the right players together. If you like, I can give you an example. A few years ago, e-scooters came into the scene and they claimed to disrupt urban mobility completely. In fact, they've become a useful mode for some people. They've shifted a few trips away from the private car. They've reduced trips that would have otherwise been walked, and they annoy many other people, but they're no way disruptive to the whole system. And that's because cities weren't involved from the beginning and many other reasons. It's just an example to show that no one single player can really disrupt mobility. A lot of different players have to work together. And that's what we do. We drive innovation for sustainable mobility in Germany and Europe by connecting the relevant players. And how will it achieve this objective? Like, what does the digital hub do in concrete terms? Can you give us any examples? I'd like to tell you three areas that we're active in. For one, we connect the relevant mobility players. So we have a huge inflow of startups through various activities, which we can connect to our partners, we connect to cities, we connect among each other. We do one trip that we call a benchmark trip every year to learn about mobility innovations in other places that are interesting. We've been to Singapore, we've been to Shenzhen, we've been to Estonia, we've been to Hamburg. And this year in the fall, we're going to Oslo. 
to learn more about green energy and mobility there. And once a year, we also do a symposium on relevant topics. So these are our networking activities that we do. And the second field, we implement collaborative cutting edge mobility projects. So we have a digital format where we build digital prototypes for certain kinds of problems that cities or companies come up with. But we also have a format called citizen mobility, where we do urban experiments on sharing and mobility behavior. And then we also do multi-stakeholder co-innovation around green energy, where we always put startups and companies together to work on new solutions. In that way, we give visible impulses to work on for companies and cities and startups. Are there any concrete examples of projects that you'd like to share with us? Yes, I'd like to maybe share the results of our project Unparken, or Unparking, if you'd say it in English. What we did there, we selected eight households in the urban area here of Munich. We gave each household mobility budget of 300 euros for a month. They promised to put their car away for the whole month. And with that mobility budget, they could use all the sharing and public transport offers that were available in their area. So public transport, shared bikes, shared cars, taxis, scooters, mopeds, their own bike, obviously, also. And we used our own app to track what they were actually using. And they logged a diary and wrote down every day how it felt, how it went, were they satisfied with their mobility or not. And it produced some very, very clear results, even on this very small scale. All these households realized that during the week, they did not need their car. They were perfectly fine using all the other modes of transport that they had, but they did need it on the weekend. People living in Munich love to go to the mountains, they love to go to the lakes, and it's almost not possible to get anywhere without your own car. So this is what I mean with a visible impulses. These results are very clear. The public transport providers, companies like car sharing companies and so on, could design new offers for the weekend that make it attractive for people to use so they could eventually get rid of their own car. One interesting initiative came up. It's called Münchner Bergbus. The German Alpenverein actually created it to do exactly that, take people to the nice spots in the mountains on the weekend with a bus. Wow, interesting. Okay. Changing chapters. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing mobility, both now and in the future? There are several. We need more companies that set out on the path to provide those viable, sustainable solutions for everyone. So that can be startups, but it can also be corporates that do that. But also we need the right regulatory framework that supports that path. Right now, we've got a lot of tax and other regulations that benefit only the car. And these should be changed, part of them abolished or revised to benefit climate neutral modes of transport more. And we also need a change of mindset. In the end, mobility is a very personal individual decision every time I move from A to B. So every time I have to go from here to somewhere else, I can take a new decision. I can make a choice about, am I going to use the car? Am I going to walk? How am I going to do it? And people must be willing to try out new solutions, try out new modes of transport, and not just rely on their established patterns like they've always done it. Sometimes it's a good opportunity to do this when you move to a different town or you start a new job just to create new routines. Are there any examples that come to mind from the cities you visited in the past? You mentioned that you visit different cities around the world as benchmarks. One thing that I experienced, for example, when we went to Shenzhen, our hotel was on a very, very busy street crossing. And I was so surprised how quiet it was because the majority of the cars, the vast majority of the cars was already electrical. So yes, I'd always known that electrical cars are not as noisy as fossil fueled cars, but I'd experienced it there for the first time. And this was very, very interesting also for the city officials and government officials that were with us on this trip because they had the same experience. And for them, it was a real aha moment. Wow, so this is what it's going to be like if 90% of the cars are electric. I think that's a great example. I think that's also very um, compelling. And it's, it's a real eye-opener in a way that you wouldn't expect because most listeners will never have been in a city with 95% electric cars, I think. 
And what role will urban transport play in the mobility of the future? On a global scale, urban centers are expanding in the world. So sustainability in the urban context is getting even more important every year. Um, however, in Germany, we don't really have these megacities. Our biggest city is Berlin. It's got 4 million people. That's not exactly what I'd call a mega city on the global scale. And in our big cities, a lot of the problems don't only originate in the city center, but they also are caused from a lot of commuters coming in from the outside. So we must also focus on the rural areas because that's where a lot of the traffic in the cities originate. For example, Munich, which has 1.5 million inhabitants, has 400,000 people commuting into the city every day, a lot of times where there's only one person sitting in one car. But on the other hand, that where they come from, these people simply don't have access to public transport that comes frequent enough uh, rhythm at the hours when they need it. So we've also taken out a lot of 3,000 kilometers of train network in the last years, and there's massive investments in all this infrastructure that is needed. And the third aspect is that the bulk of CO2 emissions doesn't originate in the cities themselves because the trips that are taken there are very short, but they actually originate in the long distance travel between our cities. How is the world of mobility, not just urban mobility, but mobility in general, set to evolve in the coming years and decades? When we started six years ago, there was a very clear framework by the automotive industry assumed that mobility would be connected, electrical, autonomous, and share. Now, a lot of the OEMs have actually moved away from that because they couldn't pull it off profitably for themselves. But I am still convinced that all of these elements are extremely relevant for the mobility of the future. So obviously, mobility will be connected. It will be electrical for the sake of local emissions. It will be autonomous. That will be a real game changer. And it must be shared because that's where the efficiency gain comes from that I talked about earlier. And would you say that sustainability is becoming an overarching requirement? Yes, absolutely. With all my previous answers, it's been quite clear that that is the one big challenge that we're facing. That's why we're doing all this. So Germany needs to be climate neutral by 2045, and the mobility sector needs to have its carbon emissions by 2030. And that's a really hard task that we need to solve. So how can we make mobility solutions more sustainable? Is electrification enough? No, electrification is not enough. It doesn't solve the problems that I've mentioned before. Electrical cars use up the same space as fossil fueled cars in urban space when they're parked. Congestion is the same for electric vehicles as for others. So electrification only solves the problem of local emissions. But in order to make the whole system more efficient, we definitely need to use the capacity of existing vehicles better than we do today. So not like I've said, only 2% of all seats at one point in time have much less vehicles run our mobility requirements in the city than we do today, and therefore have less vehicles standing around parking unused for 23 out of 24 hours a day. There's another argument that I'd like to give you for that. Our cities need to become more resilient to climate change. And for that, we need to make them a lot greener. That's not only about making it nicer for the residents, but also mitigate the heating up of the cities. And you can only do that with plants. But for those plants, you need space. So if we don't want to reduce mobility, moving, we should at least take out those elements of the traffic system that are not used, that are not moving, that are parked. So reducing parked cars is the first and most important measure to free up space, free up urban space to make our cities more climate resilient. So what technologies do you believe are essential for the mobility of the future? Basically all technologies that decrease the carbon footprint of mobility. But for me, the one big game changer will be autonomous driving because it dramatically reduces the cost of operation if used in public transport. So then if we really assume that we're going to have all these fleets of small pods cruising around the cities, taking us from A to B, if these have to be supplied with a driver in each vehicle, it's absolutely not possible. For one, from the cost and B, these drivers are not available. 
if autonomous driving is going to be available, then we can have this really, really efficient and attractive addition to backbone public transport that will make a huge difference. And the third one is we need to integrate the energy production from renewable sources with charging. So this is the whole issue of the intelligent grid that's crucial to decarbonize e-mobility. And the last thing I'd like to mention that I think is very important is batteries that don't need rare earth elements. So what do we need to do to make innovations possible and ensure their success? I think it's really crucial that we support the companies of the future that actually work and provide the solutions that we need. So we need to support startups. That's exactly what we do at Unternehmertum. We support startups from their very initial phases. We provide them with capital. We provide them with partners. We hook them up with corporates to get their first projects going. We help them find teammates and stabilize them through their path to success. And that's, from my point of view, one of the most important things that we can do. You bring together established companies, municipalities, and startups. Is there effective communication between such different market players? Well, there is not enough effective communication right now. That's why we spend so much time and energy in actually making this communication happen. Just imagine a startup that wants to work together with a city. It's terribly difficult for a startup to find its way through City Hall to find the right person to talk to. And on the other hand, even if a city would like to work with startups, they don't have the skills to look for the right startups. And this is where we do very valuable work to bring startups and cities together, but obviously also startups and corporates. We bring them together in our innovation sprints, in our urban experiments, but also in many other ways. And when you bring them together, we also see that it requires a lot of moderation skills when you actually work together. So it's important to really understand the position of every player involved and really take the needs of each player serious. And then you can move forward and create good solutions. So are there already solutions on the market that were created with the help of digital hub mobility? Yes, there are actually quite a few that we are proud of. There's, for example, our digital product school. In the very first batch, right in the first year, there was a team from BMW and Adidas that were working on an incentive for employees if they rode their bike to work more often. And this digital prototype that was created went back into the, the sort of the corporate startup garage and came out as a startup that helps companies provide a mobility budget for their employees. It's called Movester and it's alive and kicking. It's a great startup that we also work with in our experiments for mobility budgets. I'd also like to mention the collaboration that we fostered between Chargix startup and SAP, Germany's largest software company, where ChargeX and SAP worked together to build up SAP's backend for electric charging. And it really speeded up SAP's go-to-market in that area and helped ChargeX prepare itself for working with such big corporates and their demands. So what we like to create in that respect is a win-win situation. In this case, it worked really well. Are there any solutions that are in the pipeline that you can talk about that we can look forward to seeing? Well, one thing I mentioned before was the local price incentive for green charging that I mentioned earlier. Maybe we'll come up with a new product for the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing that I also mentioned before, the house flotte, as we called it. Yeah, just keep tuned. Check in on our website and you will see what happens. Okay, so this is a great place to wrap up. At the end of each episode of The Technology Addict, we ask our guests the same question. What would you say is your current technology addiction? It could be anything from a gadget that you recently bought to an entire field of technology that's uh, captivated you. Well, I'm an economist, but these whole issues of sector coupling that are becoming so important for mobility, the whole energy sector and mobility coming together, that is mind-boggling for me. I have to learn so much, but it's very, very exciting. The other thing that I'm really fascinated about is carbon capture. I like to follow what startups are evolving in that area because I think that will make a huge difference for our path to climate neutrality. And I'm really, really excited about all the startups that come up that combine the efficiency of public transport with the privacy of my own car 
startups like Dolmos and others that I really like to follow. Thank you, Kristen, for joining us for this episode of the Technology Addicts podcast. Thank you, Jan. Dear listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with Kirsten, you can reach out to her and find all the contact information in the show notes. Please feel free to subscribe to our podcast, The Technology Addicts, on your favorite podcasting platform. 